Hello friends, this is Homer Knox of MenTeachingMen.com. I'm going to continue teaching on King David. This is part three of our series on King David. The New American Standard and King James Version Bibles will be used for our scripture translation in this video, and there will be several discussion questions at the end of this video. The Life of King David, Part 3. In the previous two teachings, we saw his battle with and defeat of the giant Goliath, his problems with King Saul, his rise to power as ruler of Israel after King Saul's death, and finally we witnessed his falling into sin and his repentance and God's punishments. When we ended the last teachings, we were reviewing the betrayal from his son, Absalom. King David and Michael Studies from King David's Life Number 1. Others can affect your life, but for born-again believers, the Holy Spirit is still with you and He will help you. I would like to backtrack now on our time frame on David's life and talk about David's first wife, Michael. Michael was King Saul's younger daughter. Her name means, who is like God? Who is like God? How wonderful a name. David was part of King Saul's staff and inner circle, and he spent time with King Saul and had meals with the king. So David knew Michael and had some type of positive relationship with her. 1 Samuel 18.20 Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. The dowry set by King Saul for David to marry Michael was a hundred dead Philistines. I wonder how that would go over today. David must have been anxious to have her as he killed 200 Philistines. 1 Samuel 18.27 So King Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, for a wife. Although not listed in the scriptures, my guess is that they were very much in love and happy. When the relationship between King Saul and David deteriorated, Saul sent messengers to David's house to capture David, but Michael saves him. 1 Samuel 19.12 So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out, and fled and escaped. Well, David was now out of the picture and separated from Michael for possibly a long period of time, maybe years. 1 Samuel 25, 44. Now Saul had given Michael his daughter, David's wife, to Pate, the son of Leish, who was from Galam. What's up with this? David is gone. King Saul was an unusual father and king, certainly. After Saul's death, David requests from Saul's son the return of his first wife, Michael. 2 Samuel 3.14 So David sent messengers to Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michael. 2 Samuel 3.15-16 Is Boshis sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Leish, Verse 16, but her husband went with her, weeping as he went. This must have been crushing for Michael. David flees for his life and leaves her years alone. She is given to another man by King Saul, and this guy loves her. Possibly she loves him. Her relationship with David is now altered forever, and they become alienated. 2 Samuel 6.15 So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpets. 2 Samuel 6.16 Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Why does Michael despise King David? David had certainly moved on spiritually. They were now different people living in different worlds. David and Michael had words, and the result is not pleasant. 2 Samuel 6.23 Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. All this is sad. At least part of the root of this is King Saul. Sometimes others in our life affect us greatly. But thank God, with the help of the Holy Spirit and King Jesus, we can get our lives back in order. Scripture doesn't tell us why they had no children. Could be from God, or maybe David just didn't have relations with her. But not having children with Michael, 
David's offspring didn't have King Saul's bloodline. Study from King David's life. Number two, the ones you love can hurt you the most, but our God would never hurt us. In the teaching in part two, we ended with King David leaving Jerusalem to prevent being captured and killed by his son Absalom. Absalom's rebellion continued. 2 Samuel 16, 15. Then Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, entered Jerusalem. One of Absalom's counselors gives Absalom immoral advice to punish and to hurt King David. 2 Samuel 16, 21. Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. Oh man, what a bitter pill for King David to swallow. Think about this. Your son is having sex with your wives. Remember that in the Old Testament, multiple wives and concubines were allowed. Concubines were wives of a secondary rank. What does the scripture say on this? Deuteronomy 22.30 A man may not take his father's wife or have sex relations with a woman who is his father's. From the Bible in basic English. Absalom didn't care what the scripture said, did he? Absalom leads his army into battle against King David's army. 2 Samuel 18.5 the king charged his military leaders, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Look how loving King David deals with Absalom. Absalom forces are defeated, and Absalom is killed. 2 Samuel 18.15 And ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. David learns about Absalom's death and is distraught. Most fathers would be distraught over a son's death, a really brutal death of a beloved son. We can compare this with Christ's brutal death on the cross. 2 Samuel 18.33 The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. What a tearjerker. Even though all that Absalom did to King David, David still loved him greatly. It's a great example of our Heavenly Father's love for us. Do you think that King David would say that getting into a relationship with Bathsheba was worth all that he had to go through? My guess is it would not. King David's Friend Studies from King David's Life Proverbs 17.17 17. Number 3. A friend loves at all times. There's a very interesting man of God that comes to befriend King David before the rebellion, during the rebellion, and after the rebellion. His name is Brazilla. 2 Samuel 19.32 Now Brazilla was very old, being 80 years old, and he has sustained the king while he stayed at Mahamaim, for he was a very great man. 2 Samuel 19.33 After the victory over Absalom, the king said to Priscilla, You cross over with me, and I will sustain you in Jerusalem with me. What Priscilla requests is that he is too old, and he wants to return home. Samuel 19.37 Please let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. However, here is your servant Shilham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him what is good in your sight. Chilham was Brazilla's youngest son. Wow, let my son go with you instead of me. How interesting. Don't we all want better for our children? Don't we strive as parents to make a better life? for our children. 1 Kings 2.7 King David to Solomon, but show kindness to the sons of Brazilla, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table, for they assisted me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Studies from King David's life. Number four, sometimes we get caught in a storm caused by others, but our God will help us. 
Well, now we're going to have trouble brewing with Israel and King David, but it's not because of his sin, but King Saul's sin. 2 Samuel 21.1 Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. The children of Israel mistakenly made a covenant with the children of the Gibeonites living in the land of Israel when Israel came in to possess the land from Egypt. The Gibeonites, Joshua 9.15 Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. And later, King Saul sought to kill them. 2 Samuel 21.2 So the king, David, called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Storm clouds are brewing, a three-year drought. King David, as a great leader and man of God, seeks God's presence to find out why and how to alleviate the problem. Boy, it'd be wonderful to have leaders like that today. David also asked the Gibeonites, and their response was, 2 Samuel 21.6, Let seven men from his, Saul's, sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. Boy, this is all hard stuff. David agrees, and included in the seven are five sons of Merib, sister of his first wife, Michael. So David was the uncle of these five. How many of us would be able to hand over our nephews for slaughter? Being king is not easy, but for King David, the nation of God, Israel, comes first. 2 Samuel 21.14 And after that, God was moved by prayer for the land. David numbers the people. Studies from King David's life. Number five. Major decisions in our life require a commitment from us to seek God first for an answer. 2 Samuel 24.2 The king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go about now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and register the people, that I may know the number of the people. 1 Chronicles 21.7 God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. I am unsure why this upset God that he punishes Israel. It might be because of a scripture in Exodus. Exodus 30:12. When you take a census of the sons of Israel to number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. 1 Chronicles 21:8. David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, but now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. David learns from his previous sins, confess them right away, and that's what he does here. As believers, we learn as we grow in Jesus Christ. 1 Chronicles 21.10 The prophet Gad is speaking to David. Go and speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. 1 Chronicles 21.13 David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hands of man. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. Isn't this a precious scripture? about God, just precious. First Chronicles 21, 16. Then David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, with his sword drawn in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, covered with sackcloth, fell on their faces. When we are in distress, get a prayer meeting going. Let others have the benefit of praying for you, fasting for you, and seeking the Lord with you. Let them have the blessing of sharing your victory. First Chronicles 21:17. O Lord my God, 
Please let your hand be against me and my father's household, but not against your people that they should be plagued. A wonderful verse that shows the great love David had for his people and the nation Israel. The Apostle Paul had the same great love for his people Israel. Romans 9, 3, the Apostle Paul is talking. For I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. First Chronicles 21.18 Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. First Chronicles 21.22 Then David said to Onan, Give me the site of this threshing floor, that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. For the full price you shall give it to me. Just a great scripture. First Chronicles 21.26 Then David built an altar to the Lord there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he called to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offerings. Praise God, David obeys and the plague is stopped among the people. The location of the altar site in Jerusalem was Mount Moriah, where Abraham was directed to sacrifice Isaac. The future location of the temple built by David's son Solomon and where Christ was crucified. Genesis 22:14. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the Mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Studies from King David's Life. Number six, let us prepare our worship facilities for the next generation of worshipers. God did not allow King David to build the temple, but David provided for the future construction with the materials needed. First Chronicles 22.8 But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood on the earth before me. 1 Chronicles 29.2 King David is speaking. Now with all my ability I have provided for the house of my God, the gold for the things of the gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and the wood for the things of wood. I just can't keep warm. 1 Kings 1.1 1, 1. Now King David was old, advanced in age, and they covered him with clothes, but he could not keep warm. 1 Kings 1-2 So his servants said to him, Let them seek a young virgin for my lord the king, and let her attend the king and become his nurse, and let her lie in your bosom, that my lord the king may keep warm. Well, what happened to Bathsheba? Where was she? I personally have always thought that King David lost respect for Bathsheba sometimes after the adultery, and now she is on the outside looking in. This will all change when her son Solomon takes over. Another of King David's sons wants to take over, but not God-ordained. 1 Kings 1.5 Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen with fifty men to run before him. 1 Kings 1.6 His father, King David, had never crossed him at any time. This would be the third son that King David never crossed. Ammon, Absalom, Adonijah. All three sons would lose their lives over their rebellion. You would think that Adonijah would have learned from remembering what happened to Absalom. No, he forges onward. King David chooses his successor. 2 Samuel 12, 24 And she, Bathsheba, gave birth to a son, and he, King David, named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. The first child died due to David's sin. Now there is a second child who God loves. How could this be? How could this be? Well, the first child's death was caused by King David's sins. Now there is forgiveness as King David paid the price for his sins. 
My guess is that when King David found out that Bathsheba was pregnant again, he started praying and fasting to God for this child. God loves all babies, but this child through David's prayers, who will become Israel's anointed leader, is special. And he will take over as the ruler of Israel after King David entering into glory. 1 Kings 1.17 Bathsheba to King David My Lord, you swore to your maidservant by the Lord your God, saying, Surely your son Solomon shall be king after me and shall sit on my throne. So Solomon takes over the leadership of Israel upon David's death and continues the messianic lineage ending with the birth of Jesus Christ. We don't often remember the many wonderful traits of King David. He was a musician, a poet, a warrior, an organizer, the psalmist, a lover of God's word, his family, and a lover of God. 1 Kings 15.5 David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. 2 Samuel 8.15 So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. In this study, we have seen the many victories and defeats in David's life. As David had many victories in his life, we can also have victories through the blood of Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 1 Corinthians 15.57 But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5.4 For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to study and learn from King David's marvelous life. Amen and amen. A summary of studies from King David's life. Number one, others can affect your life, but for born-again believers, the Holy Spirit is still with you and He will help you. Number two, the ones you love can hurt you the most. Number three, Proverbs 17:17, 17, 17, a friend loves at all time. Number four, sometimes we get caught in a storm caused by others, but our God will help us. Number five, Major decisions in our life require a commitment from us to seek God first for the answers. Number six, let us prepare our worship facilities for the next generation of worshipers. Discussion questions. Number one, how would King David's life have been different without Bathsheba? Number two, how would your life have been different without some of the major sins you committed? Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men Teaching Men YouTube channel. Hello friends, this is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior and are you saved? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was crucified and he rose from the dead on the third day. He's now ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. There is salvation in no one else, no one else. And so if this has stirred your heart and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you'd like to reserve a place in heaven for you, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins, all my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me the Holy Spirit, and thank you for making me a new creature. Amen and amen. Well, if you prayed this prayer from your heart for the first time, you're now born again, you're a Christian, you're part of the family, praise God. Welcome, welcome. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're now back in the kingdom, you're back in the fold. Congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you on your new walk with Jesus Christ. And I've listed the address to that video below. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.